Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Senate Education on Tuesday, March 26th. Uh, today, we are doing a couple of different things. We are still spending a lot of time, a lot of afternoons and mornings on the Senate floor, moving bills, but we uh, missed the Act 77 presentation. Our House counterparts invited us to participate in one a while back. We couldn't do it, so we have uh, some students with us today, and we're looking forward to hearing from all of you. Then uh, Austin Davis, uh, who is the Director of Government Affairs, uh, Lake Champlain Regional Chamber of Commerce, asked me to talk to us a little bit about tax and education is issues. And we have an amendment for 220, Senator Renner, um, and we'll have a little conversation about uh, CTEs, and we'll wrap it up after that. So, Ms. Holland, uh, would you, who is first? I'm going to be first. Right, please and, have a seat. Sure. And what about our slides? Are they, they're not like slides that we can project? Uh, Are they in your packet? They have them in our packet. Okay. Um, we can project. Could you project you guys, I think, because everyone prepared to kind of, yes, yeah. exactly. So which uh, which group? 10 years of Act 77? Oh, 10 years of Act 77, yeah. and that's it? You just need to let me know when you want the. Yeah, I'll just right. let you know. We can go until about 205. So 205, okay. So. Okay. Great. Floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Lindsay Hallman. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the executive director at Elk for Learning. We're a nonprofit based here in Vermont. And um, we are here to um, share with you about an event that happened on December 7th here, but the reason why we had the event, um, which was to celebrate the 10th uh, anniversary of Act 77 flexible pathways legislation. So I want to just kind of frame it and then I'll share the goals. And then a lot, most of this can be turned over to my um, my colleagues over here, and um, and we also have a video that we want to share with you from the event. So, um, as you know, uh, Vermont, bless you, has been a national and international leader in education. And um, I want to just highlight a few of the key moves that Vermont made that led to Act 77 Flexible Pathways in 2013. Um, lots happened before this, but one the place I'm going to start is in 2007 with the publication of The Future of Education in Vermont. And this articulated the vision of the State Board of Education and the then Commissioner of Education. And it identified five components of a desired state to be addressed. Student-centered learning, leadership, flexible learning environments, engaged community partners, and indicators of success. In 2009, the Vermont legislator developed and passed what became Act 44, this contained the first use of the phrase flexible pathway to graduation and established the goal of a 100% graduation rate by 2020. Still working on that. Mm -hmm. Act 44 was the basis for the statutory language that would become Act 77 of 2013. Act 77 of 2013 was passed in July of 2013 to ensure that all Vermont students have access to high quality educational experiences that will prepare them for life after graduation. And Act 77 is grounded in what we now know about learning and the brain. The law also seeks to make school relevant to our changing world and ensure equitable opportunities for all of Vermont's youth. So, what did teaching and learning look like in Vermont's kind of systems that embrace student centered practices made possible through Act 77 and expanded upon through other landmark legislation in Vermont? Our goal today is to share that. And we want to share the impact that Act 77 has had on the educational landscape of Vermont over the past decade to support deeper learning for our students and school communities. And we want to urge you to recommit to the spirit and intent of this legislation as you think about current and future legislative priorities for Vermont's youth. So I'm going to turn it over to Ethan and Olivia. We're going to lead you through a little activity. And please know if the movies or anything is bothering you at all, we'll just close the door. Great. Or, or anything. Please. Okay. Uh, want to pull up an extra chair? Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll set up. They're going to be there for a while. Welcome. Um, hi. Um, I'm Olivia Siri. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. Uh, hi, my name is Ethan Samor. I use he, her pronouns. Uh, so, we would just like to ask you guys to think of like a specific, meaningful, or engaging learning opportunity 
um, that you've had in your life um, and like when you were maybe most engaged um, and just really like bring it to life in your mind. Um, what did it look like and um, how did it make you feel? So we'll give you a second for that. Okay, so now we can just do like a quick couple minute circle share around. Um, like you can describe what like moment you thought of, how it made you feel. Yeah, you want it? I think Senator Reed's going on. I don't know. I'm, ha I'm happy to break the ice. I just I thought back to sixth grade, and we had a terrific sixth grade teacher, great teacher all the way through. Uh, but this particular teacher did uh, a big end of the year play with all the students. And it was just great in terms of building student confidence. They had to do all sorts of things out of our comfort zone. He was very encouraging and warm about it. it was, I just remember it quite well. I can go next because I could tell Senator Machine is still thinking. Oh, I've got mine. I was just asking. Okay. <laughs> Good yeah, I got. Sure. Uh, yeah, so. A meaningful experience. So yeah, in college, I took a class. It was a night class about Lord of the Rings. And it was it was a English lit class, really just for a few extra credits. And I took the class for granted and I assumed everything was gonna go totally fine. And so I didn't put as much effort into it compared to all my other classes. Uh, ended up getting a C in the class because the professor took it very, very seriously. And Basically, just learn to you know, don't take any subject matter for granted. We passed the literacy bill today up in the Senate, and um, it's been making me think about how I learned to read. And I, I couldn't help but go back to my first grade class at Central School in South Burlington um, with Miss Coughlin, who um, would I just remember her kind of being next to me and like helping me sound out my words. And that's how I learned to read. Um, fifth or sixth grade, history teacher, really motivated, totally into the topic, totally into the kids, uh, all the kids, all of us, getting something out of it on a personal basis. And I could see right then that teaching was a profession, and not all teachers are created equal, but this guy was something really special. Great. Right. Um, thank you for sharing. Is there a senator that's on? Yeah, I'm not sure if, if Senator Williams, are you there? May have stepped away. Okay, thank you. I'll be inclusive. <laughs> <laughs> um, and maybe just think of like one word um, that like you notice that some of these experience, experiences like have in common. Um, yeah, I personally notice like a lot around education, which is very important. Um, I was just thinking growth. Like, I feel like growth, learning how to read or realizing that you can't take classes for granted. I just think that word came up. Word, a word that comes up for me is respect. Um, I, some of my most important teachers at the time, I didn't necessarily like them very much because they pushed me hard, but I respected them. And I think that's kind of what stuck with me for time. Growth. I'll, I'll, I agree with you. That's not a good word for it. I like growth, respect, and yeah. You repeat the question. Yeah, just think of like um, maybe one word that you notice these um, experiences like have a call. First word was respect. Uh, so I, I respect people who are highly motivated in their subject matter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you want to do amazing or should I? Well, we're going to show the video and then we'll do that. Yeah, so thank you both. So um, on December 7th, you all received an invitation. I know not everyone was available to attend. 
And uh, we were here at the State House, uh, youth and adults from across the state in a variety of roles to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Act 77 Flexible Pathways. And there was a planning team that planned that event on December 7th that consisted of uh, the Agency of Education, Pat Fitzsimmons is here as a representative of that team, um, Carol and Weir from uh, McClure Foundation, the Vermont Principal Association, uh, Ashley Newton is on um, Zoom from Vermont Virtual Learning Cooperative, <laughs> and, and Up for Learning. Uh, my organization as well. So there was uh, a group of us that came together to realize this is the 10th year, and we wanna make sure that we lift up the spirit and intent of this really important legislation and um, have a day where we can all gather together to learn from the past 10 years and then uh, think ahead to what the next 10 years might bring. So if it's okay for me to share my screen, I'm gonna share a video that highlights that day. I think there's even more of a feel for it. Mute. Do I have to unmute or will the sound come through? Not sure. Um, I'll try hitting play. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, now I'll try muting it. Oh, we'll let Morgan unmute it. Okay. Do you have your sound on? Maybe you should. Let me turn, if you turn yours off, yeah. are we going to get the echo?
77's astounding success. I'd like to thank you all. Thank you all for being here, uh, for spending your day here at the State House, and we hope to come together again sometime soon. We wanted to give you a feel for the day and thank you for letting us use your place of work uh, for that uh, great celebration and sharing opportunity. So now we're going to hear from this whole group here about what it looks like for them. We have folks here from various stages in their educational journey. I just want to start, um, well, I think we could go in order. We will, I can read Maisie's when we get there. We have one of our um, youth that could not be here because she's actually at UVM in her class right now. So she, I have something to read from her. So we can advance uh, probably a couple now. And we'll go to Olivia. Um, um, so yeah, I introduced myself earlier, but I will again. Um, so my name is Olivia Siri. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm a freshman at CBU High School. Um, I personally have benefited a lot from Act 77 um, and feel like I've been able to extend my learning on a lot of topics in a lot of different ways. Um, I, you see my slide, there's um, UC Scout on there, which is uh, like an online program through the University of California. Um, I have David Superman on there because he came to my school and gave a little presentation um, and I was able to miss class to go to that. And there's other opportunities like that at CBU. Um, there's the cover slide to my um, my PLP. Um, and so I'm kind of going to go into detail on a couple of the things that I've been able to experience. Um, last year, I had the opportunity to take an accelerated math class through UC Scout, um, and it's allowed me to skip into a higher level class at CBU. Um, and then recently, I enrolled myself in another extra math course um, through UC Scout, and I'll finish that in August. And as a sophomore, I'll be going, if everything goes right, I'll be going to AP Calculus next year. Um, I've also been able to work with um, up for learning, and sometimes I have to step out of class uh, to attend meetings. Um, my teachers have been like spectacular at working with my schedule, um, and they've just like supported me the whole way through. Uh, they've offered like a bunch of alternatives, so I can say up to par in the classroom while also getting to experience opportunities like this. Um, inside of the school, Act 77 has made it so that we have access to a PLP, um, which is a personalized learning portfolio. And CDU also offers a class called Nexus Seminar, um, which is a flexible learning environment course. Uh, in the future, I am looking forward to taking that class, where hopefully I can do an, an independent study of my choice, which will be most likely focused around youth leadership and voice. Um, it's, Act 77 is really important to me because it's allowed me as well as many other people to go through personalized courses um, with support from the school. And it's made me feel a lot more seen like in the classroom by my educators and has definitely helped me to become really excited about my learning. Uh, I've enjoyed learning from a young age, but once I started taking like advantage of the resources that we have in Vermont with Act 77, uh, my level of engagement has definitely increased. Um, and 
Yeah, overall, without Act 77, I don't think I'd be able to access the programs that I really enjoy doing. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. In our next slide, Ethan. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Ethan Samor. I use he him pronouns, and I'm also a freshman at CBU. Act 77 opened up so many more opportunities for me as a student that I probably couldn't get elsewhere. Um, CBU's RISE program reflected interest-based student experiences, gives students the opportunity to explore interest within and outside of the school community, so this June, I'm going to be helping teach younger kids how track meets work, what goes into them, and then putting on a track meet for them. And I'll also be exploring small businesses in the Chittenden County area. Some other RISE sessions include hiking, photography, Dungeons and Dragons, Life Garden CPR certification, and it really ranges to all kinds of student interests to make sure every student in the CBU building can spend the last two weeks of the school year doing something that they're interested and passionate about. Uh, another thing from Act 77, POPs, or Personalized Learning Portfolios, are a way for students to share their accomplishments and goals with teachers, parents, advisors. And students can also share other important parts of their lives, like sports, family, friends, hobbies, anything that they really want to share on there portfolios they can't share. And I know for many students, me included, sometimes have a difficult time focusing in a classroom setting and building connections with their teachers. And with Act 77, it's, uh, it gives students the opportunity to create connections with teachers or adults in the building and explore, exploring interests that they couldn't explore cooped up in a classroom learning the typical school stuff. Personally, myself, I want to be a future business owner, and my RISE session gives me that opportunity to learn what goes into making that hope of mine a reality. And for many other students, RISE gives them, RISE gives them that same opportunity. And I believe that's what's so important about Flexible Pathways and Act 77 is with opportunities created from Act 77, students can really show their creativity and express themselves in a way that they probably couldn't anywhere else. Mm -hmm. That's all I have to do. Great. Good luck with the track meet. Okay. Sounds cool. Olivia, next slide. Yep. Hi, so I am Olivia Schoenberg. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a sophomore at Montpelier High School down the road. <laughs> Um, yeah, so my journey with Flexible Pathways really started in, like, middle school, which is kind of different than other people's. Like, in seventh grade was when I was really first exposed to, like, all of the available, like, learning opportunities, and I recognized that other kids used to not have these when they were, like, a few years ago, before X and was passed. Uh, like, one of these in was involving, like, CPS, the organization, which is like Cultivating Pathways to Sustainability, which is connected with Up for Learning. And it helped me make a sustainability class that is now taught at the middle school for all different, for fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. And I like the opportunities that I had, like creating the curriculum and like going out in public and learning about how sustainability is like in like how that is implemented into schools and should be implemented more often and it's, it was really interesting just to learn about the impacts that schools have on the environment and I learned a lot like relating to science and yeah so that was seventh and eighth grade was when I was a part of that and it also encouraged me to take like facilitation roles from seventh grade and beyond um like I became more of an extroverted person I feel like because I was so used to presenting due to like me having to present at these meetings related to the class that I was on board with making at middle school. And like my teachers were very supportive, like excusing me from school, like giving me opportunities to like of leadership and facilitation roles more often throughout my school day. And then now at the high school at MHS, um, 
Yeah, so these are the different opportunities that are at the high school on this list. I took this from the website. <laughs> I have not done like most of these because I'm only a sophomore. Most of these are available to juniors and seniors. But one of the things that my school does that I think is really like amazing is the PLS, which is a personal learning study. And it's kind of similar to the RISE thing that you guys do at CDU. And it's basically like a self-paced course of your own choosing for any kind of credit that you want. And one of my friends, Gardner, on the slide right there, it's a little bit of a silly picture, but <laughs> he did a PLS for his cross country season this fall. And it's like, for if you can do it for once for one semester or for both semesters throughout the school year. And he got a PE credit by running and keeping track and making his own like summatives, like tests for something that he was personally interested in. And he got credit for it so he didn't have to take the school gym classes because he doesn't tend to do well in larger environments like that. And it was really cool, like seeing how some of my other friends have done these too, like using their interests to really give them up, like using that to their advantage in class if they do not work well in personal, like in class settings. And I really think that Act 77 is so important. It's allowed me, like I said earlier, to become a more extroverted person more confident and like giving me more opportunities to do things like this. And like another thing that is up on there is CBLs, like which are community-based learning. And that's something that you can do, like again, during the senior year. So I have signed up to do one for next year, my junior year, where you can like shadow the kind of job that you would like to pursue in the future as a possibility to kind of see if you would be interested in that field actually like seeing it in action. So one thing I'm going to do next year is shadow social worker. And I've because I've kind of been inspired by like the sort of practices and the like sustainability work that I worked on in middle school really carried me along and helped me realize that I feel a connection with working with people. So I think it's really cool that I can utilize that and have it be a part of my schoolwork where I can like really explore, see if it's something that I really want to pursue. And I think it's very important for, I kind of looked out with my brain and how it works in a school setting. So I, I can usually adapt to many different teachers learning or teaching styles, but like so many of these things that are available at my school are really good opportunities, like for alternative teaching methods and learning methods for non-traditional learners, which I think is very important to have implemented in schools. And yeah, it's pretty much. Thank you. Wow, very good. Thanks. Next up is Mary. Slide. Welcome. Hey, Hi, guys. I'm Mary, and I'm a junior at Minsky High School and Center for Technology at Six. Um, I thought the CT was for that. <laughs> <laughs> and this is my journey with Act 77. So, um, Minsky has this class called iLab where you can do anything you want and like. You have a program for something here. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, fine. You can take whatever class, like do whatever you want, and then you can get credit for it. So for my freshman year, I did that class because I want to have more fun freshman year. And I took uh, for the first semester, I did Japanese. It's because Misty doesn't have a Japanese class, so I wanted I really want to take Japanese out here on the way. And um they paid a class for me that was like two hundred dollars. And I thought that was really Nice. And then the next semester, I wanted to learn about forensic science. So they gave me a bunch of books and pictures and stuff for me to do that. And then I did a bunch of case studies. And throughout the process, the teachers really supported me in my learning. And during all that, I realized I also want to do something in the healthcare setting. But the problem was that Lucy doesn't have in classes that cater to that. And so my sophomore year, I did pre-tech three at CTE. And um, that class prepares you, it's like, it's the human services. So it prepares you to a bunch of human services like cooking, um, child education, and the healthcare setting. And during all that, it was very hands-on and I got to learn a lot of stuff and a lot of careers that I can possibly have in the near future. And then now in my junior, junior year, I did the health professions program at CTV. And it, those classes have helped me 
prepare for my future goal as a healthcare worker. And I really like how hands on health professions have been so far. Like um, recently, we just did the body, so I did a bunch of like blood draws. <laughs> you guys, like, if you need any testing, I got you. <laughs> and then um, we also work on mannequins as patients, as you can see in that picture. But in that one, we went to the Vermont Technical College and we did a bunch of hair on mannequins. So that mannequin was pregnant and we were giving delivery. I mean, helping her give delivery. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and, uh, and on top of that, I'm also taking a CCP class at Wait, I'm also able to take CCV classes as a high schooler. Those are college classes. And the co class I'm taking right now is the statistics. And in my senior year, I plan on doing early college. So that gives me one year of college. And I, all of these opportunities have challenged my learning and helped me take classes that I otherwise wouldn't have been able to at regular school. And and otherwise, my classes would also just been the regular slideshows, worksheet, and listen to the teacher. But not everyone learns like that. I know I don't like that. But I've been able to do all this all thanks to Axel Seven. Great. Thank you. Ms. Hoffman, how are we doing with time and witnesses? Okay, we've got Ivy and Donovan and Maisie really quick. So maybe right. like how much time do you and I wanted to give you some time for questions. Right, too. right, right. So yeah, how much I think time? we can we can we um we we pushed our witness to fifteen. Great. Oh, okay. okay, great. We can do it. We can do it all. <laughs> all right, Ivy's next. <laughs> the next slide. Ivy's still on. Hello, my name is Ivy Manchester. I am a student at Otter Valley Union High School. And I am a part of the Musa Malu program. Musa Malu is a three year program. So there's Lower Musa Malu, which is for ninth graders. And it's kind of like an introduction to like what we do in Upper Musa Malu. This is my final year. So I have been able to learn all kinds of things like rock climbing, winter camping. Um, things go well next week. I will be Wilderness First Aid certified. Um, I would not have been able to be a part of this program without Act 77, and it, it's changed my life, to be honest, like, become a lot more confident and willing to take risks, and just being here, I would never be able to do without, like, confidence this program has given me, and... <laughs> so... Moose Malu gives students an opportunity to, like, learn in a less traditional way. So, like, we're still learning all our subjects, like social studies and science, but it's just mixed in with everything else. I learned about Moose Malu when I was in third grade, because we have elementary outreaches where we reach out to local elementary schools. So we bring them here to Otter Valley for a day, and we teach them about what we've been learning. So I was able to do that when I was in third grade. And ever since then, I wanted to be a part of this program. Even though, like, I was in third grade, I didn't pick up a lot during that. I was excited to be outside. But Moose Malu is so much more than just going outside and, like, fooling around and whatever. Like, I've learned life skills that many of my peers would never know. Um, you're doing great. Right. There. No, you're, you're doing so well. I, I want to get out there on the canoe with you. Mm -hmm. That was amazing. Yeah, that was my overnight, the, the first overnight this year. And we spent the night out on the Connecticut River, which was amazing. And then I had a rock climbing trip, which is what second picture is about and i went back last summer and climbed that cliff with my uncle i wouldn't have known it existed without Moose and lou and then the 
picture of me is on Mount Washington, which was the day after my 16th birthday. So we went up and we spent the night and we almost got to the top, but it was too foggy. And I would have never been able to do that without Act 77 and Moose Malou. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up is Donovan, who's on Zoom. And it'd be the next slide. We just need to unmute Donovan. Um, can you all hear me? Yeah. yeah. All right. Hello, guys. My name is Donovan. Um, I use he, him pronouns. Um, I'm currently a senior at Richford Junior Senior High School, but I'm also a freshman at CCV um, before the um, early college program that I'm in. Um, on top of doing early college, I'm also a part of the free degree program which basically means that if I stay at CCV for two years, I can basically get a free associate's degree. Um, I kind of just jumped right into that already. So, um, but so the way how I've been able to get into these programs is, you know, through Act 77, letting me be able to take um, a step further into my education and rather than spending my time at, you know, doing my traditional senior year at high school, I can really expand what I'm wanting to learn right now and um, just pursue what I really want to do. That's why I couldn't come in today because I'm currently one of my classes is for me to do an internship. And that's where I currently am at the moment at my internship location. Um, on top of being able to further pursue higher education my senior year, um, I've been able to still partake in like school activities. Um, the bottom two pictures on my slide are from my final dance season this year, ended last month. Uh, those were me and my team shortly before we went to go perform our uh, palm routine. And then um, my instruments, those are what I play in the school band that they still let me partake in. And um, Finally, something else that um, being able to go do early colleges is um, during like my free time, I'm still able to work and like earn money so that when I transfer out of CCV and go to pursue further call or further education for like my bachelor's, um, I can save up that money. And I currently work, <clears throat> sorry, um, at one of my, so my, sorry, I'm all over the place. My internship is a part of Notch, which has a whole bunch of different uh, buildings and facilities. And one of their places is Main Street Market, which is right below me, actually. And that's where I work during the day outside of my school hours. Um, so, yeah, that's basically um, a lot that Act 77 has helped for me and be able to achieve outside of normally just sitting in a classroom all day, learning um, in a traditional high school. Very cool. Thank Great. you, Donovan. Terrific. And finally, the next slide is Maisie, who was hoping to be here um, on Zoom, but she's at UVM and had a class um, that she had to attend. And so what you've heard so far is the journey from basically from freshman year, or even middle school, talking about middle school, um, to now Maisie, who is post high school and is in her first year at UVM. And what she said, she said, I wanted to share a bit about my journey through high school and college. I feel so incredibly lucky to have been able to learn under Act 77 in high school with opportunities like dual enrollment and flexible pathways. I entered college with skills, knowledge, and experience and college credits that I would never have been able to attain solely through high school. I was able to become a strong leader and public speaker I was prepared for networking and creating meaningful connections, and I had a chance to explore my interests. In high school, I co-taught and planned courses, which eventually led to a finished curriculum being implemented throughout the state. I'll just add my own little editorial. Maisie graduated from Harwood uh, Union. I graduated last year feeling ready to take on jobs, classes, and real life situations. This learning was a progression throughout high school and is what makes me so grateful to have grown up in Vermont, 
and inspires me to push for education standards like ours all around the country. Thank you. That's Macy Frankie, who is currently in her class at UVM. Um, and I just want to, we have, a, before we turn it over to questions, I want to turn it over to Ashley, who's on Zoom, and then Natalie, and we can see what time we have, Carolyn, and to hear a little bit of the perspective from, you heard from youth, to hear the adult perspective as well. So Ashley, over to you. And there's no slide for this one, so you can just, just Ashley. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to share my experience. Um, as noted earlier, I am the co-director of the Vont Virtual Learning Cooperative and going to chime in on the Act 77 and the impact of flexible pathways for virtual and online learning. Um, so Act 77 is important to continue to champion because it promotes equitable access to education by providing students with a diverse learning opportunities, one of which includes online and virtual ed. This is particularly important for students who may not thrive in a traditional classroom settings or who require flexibility due to personal circumstances. We heard that from many of you who shared your educational experience. What were those moments when you got to interact in a play, when someone sat down next to you to teach you how to read? These are the exciting parts. Act 77 supports personalized learning, allowing students to learn at their own pace and in ways that suit their individual learning styles. Online and virtual learning platforms can offer tailored experiences, catering to each student's needs and interests. We are always excited when students come to us and say, I have a passion to learn about this. Let's create an independent project. Or we don't offer AP physics, or we don't have this class, but this is an area that I want to look at. Can you offer this class? And we do. In addition, which we've seen today from the fine young students who have presented, Act 77 is essential for developing executive functioning skills such as digital literacy, communication, collaboration, and critical thinking. Act 77 support for these modes of learning ensures that students are prepared for the demands of the modern workforce. In addition to this, in our increasing digital world, proficiency in online and virtual environments is essential. Act 77's emphasis on these modes of learning help prepare students for higher ed and future careers where online tools and technologies are in use. In conclusion, from my experience here at the Vermont Virtual Learning Cooperative, Act 77 has promoted access to an equity, personalized learning, and the development of these executive functioning skills. It fosters innovation, adaptability, resilience, and continuity in education. I look forward to seeing what the next 10 years of Act 77 will provide to the state and to the students that we serve. Thank you. Hi, I'm Natalie Searle. I'm the Director of Secondary Education Initiatives at the Community College of Vermont. And um, you've probably you've heard a number of students talk about CCV already today. And um, we're so happy for the um, role we can provide in supporting students through their journeys at um, CCV. Um, we're offering 150 classes in high schools and technical centers just this semester. So uh, it's done wonders in terms of providing access for students. Um, there are sort of three areas where I think Pac-77 has had um, benefits across the state, um, students, programs, and partnerships. So for students, um, six, since 2013, more students have access to opportunities that allow them to connect their educational journey to their personal goals. Pac-77 empowers students to find their purpose and connect with mentors, community members, teachers, employers, and others to help them envision and create lives for themselves in the future in Vermont. Um, as far as programs are concerned, at CCD, we see students from middle school access days right through dual enrollment, um, Fast Forward, which is our partnership with technical centers, um, and then early college, and then the free degree promise. So these programs allow students to start as early as sixth grade and access free opportunities right through an associate degree program right now. So um, we're so happy to be able to allow students access to post-secondary education. Um, and then in terms of partnerships, um, flexible pathways really open the doors for different constituents to start working together. Um, CCB um, works with part in partnership now um, with almost every high school and technical center in the state. Um, but we also see um, parents connecting with school counselors, community leaders, providing opportunities to schools, 
Um, and then more um, integration between um, the colleges across the state in terms of supporting um, students. Act 77, for example, says that if students earn dual enrollment credit at one college in Vermont, all the other colleges that participate in the program have to accept that credit. So it's created some wonderful partnerships across the state. And um, I think continuing to promote Act 77 for the next 10 years will provide just an amazing opportunity um, for students, schools, and the communities in Vermont. Thank you. And I might have exceeded my one minute. No, this is Carol. Uh, <laughs> yes. Does the committee have any questions right now? We're getting close to, I want to give people a breather for our next witness. Nothing right now. Okay. Anything else? Yes. Okay. Carolyn, would you like right. to go? Oh, great. And then we'll just talk about our last slide, which is recommendation from the board, and then we'll open it for questions if there are any. Yep. And we will be done by 2 15. Great. Um, Please speak through it. Hi, everyone. Carolyn Weir, okay. Executive Director of the McClure Foundation. We're an affiliate of the Vermont Community Foundation that works to close opportunity gaps here in Vermont by making post secondary education the easy choice. And um, it has been a no brainer for us to support the equitable and meaningful implementation of this legislation for the past 10 years. And that's been the bulk of our work as a grant maker here in Vermont. We've learned a lot through supporting the implementation of this bill in the past 10 years. Our grant making is focused both on supporting the capacity of CCD to deliver some of these programs alongside the full continuum of youth and secondary education programs as Vermont's access institution, but it also looks like dozens and dozens of easy access and mini grants to schools all across the state. Um, mini grants that are in alignment with the occupational projections data coming out of um, the administration of the Vermont Department of Labor. Um, this bill informs really almost everything that we do. And 10 years in, the biggest learning that we have, um, I guess there are two. Number one, there are huge strides being made right now in equitable access of many of these flexible pathways. And for us as a foundation, that means we're excited to recommit at this anniversary as well, in uh, the same way we hope legislators do too. Um, so if I may just ask a on that theme, so if we brought some of the poorest high schools in, would we have the same quality in terms of presentations and access, do you think? Well, I think- Even what your sort of your sort of, from your vantage point and the way that the current foundation's investing. So flexible pathways means a lot of different things to different people, right? For some people, it's a mindset and a cultural approach to learning. For others, it's a set of state administered and funded programs. Um, for others, it's a school-based program. And for some folks in the public K-12 system, it's a part of their job title, right? Yeah. Um, Flexible Pathways is showing up in all schools. And when we assess uh, some of the uh, access data that is available statewide for some state administered programs, we've been really excited to see things like a 70% increase in uh, early college enrollment at CCD over the past 18 months and doubled the number, number of first generation college students. Um, and digging into, okay, where are there still gaps? Participation among young men, um, some gaps regionally in parts of the state. Um, and where there are gaps, what are those young people doing? We were just invited to a national, to participate in the Gates Foundation supported national movement to equitably scale accelerated pathways to free associate degrees. And they're helping us get closer to approximate voice um, and understand what that work might look like. Um, I'll leave that up. Great. Thank you. So if we could go back to the slides for a moment and then we'll be, we'll back it up. And while we're going back to the slides, I just want to share, in my previous role, I was, I was an educator. You haven't heard the educator voice, really. Um, so I was a 15-year middle-level educator um, before I joined Up for Learning. So I just want to share really quickly that um, I, I was grateful to be part of the public education system here in Vermont, both pre- and post-Act 77. Um, and in 2009, backed up by all that strong vision and policy that I shared earlier, um, I was basically gifted the opportunity to co-found the Edge Academy, which was a school within a school at Essex Middle School. Um, this was transformation of education, and um, these practices were celebrated and really encouraged. And that means that it wasn't, I think, you know, we often think of high school journey. So Act 77 is that all 7th through 12th graders will have a personalized learning plan that allows them to explore flexible pathways and it should go beyond. It should go before seventh grade, too. So these practices are best practices. So I just wanted to share um, 
that piece and one quick story before we get to our recommendations and then we'll we'll definitely be wrapped up. Um, so even before, in 2009, before um, Act 77 in 2013, um, the young people that I worked with in fifth through eighth grade had personalized learning plans, proficiency-based assessment, and were provided opportunities to explore different pathways. These are fifth through eighth graders. This is before Act 77. So these are practices that we know are really important for all young people and their equitable practices. And the other day I ran into a um, father of a student that I had uh, a decade, almost a decade ago. As a middle schooler, Michaela, she was very passionate about drawing and writing. And I ran in and social justice. And during her student-led personalized learning plan conferences um, that happened throughout the year, and I was her advisor, her and her family and I would sit and talk about how she could enhance her skills and really pursue her passions and work on the issues that were challenges. Well, now, fast forward nine years later, I ran into her father. She's now a junior at Savannah College of Art and Design, pursuing writing and drawing. And I think that that just shows, as you heard from all these stories here, that when given the opportunity to explore these passions and not saying, stop writing on the desk or, the, you know, writing it, doodling or whatever it is, that when people have the opportunity to explore passions, they um, they actually follow those pathways. And here she is in her uh, final year at uh, SCAD. So recommendations came out of this um the day, the celebration. You can see them all here. You can see kind of who was here by the numbers and the data that came out of the day, uh, along with the commitments that we hope to see ripple out. But really what it means is continuing to explore support and strengthen connections between schools and community partners. We need to continue to develop and share and um, create resources for Act 77 related concepts that came out loud and clear throughout the day. And um, we want to ensure that there's increased access to flexible pathways, um, particularly for those that are in smaller programs at schools or for supporting innovative individuals or schools that don't have as um, many, or as you said, are as resources as other schools. So continuing to increase access. 215. Great. <laughs> it up. Right. And I think what we'll do with questions is we will break. We we have other witnesses coming in. So during the break, if people have questions, they can mix and mingle with the students and we'll come back. Welcome back everyone to Senate Education. Uh we understand that you are, Mr. Davis, making the rounds, talking to people a little bit about Vermont's property tax system with some recommendations, some thoughts. You know, I met with the pro tem a little bit yesterday evening, afternoon, and he put some ideas. So it's we know that there's this this general conversation that's going to is happening, is going to happen. A bunch of bills coming out of the house, um, all sorts of conversation. So we appreciate you coming in, sharing your thoughts with us. And so we'll give you the floor for about 20, 30 minutes, and then we'll jump in for questions. Sounds good. Or however a committee wants to fair with you, sometimes just throw the questions out. Well, yeah, I'd love to keep it a conversation. Two conversation Beautiful. Rather than talk Beautiful. Can't wait. Uh, so for the record, Austin Davis, Director of Government Affairs, Bully Champlain Chamber. Um, and I want to start this. I'll try to be, I, I had a note at the outset that I spent an hour and a half with the House Education Committee last week. We don't have that much time. But uh, I do want to some brief acknowledgments of limitations as we start out here, and that is the Lake Champlain Chamber is not an expert on education policy. We do a lot in tax and economic development and workforce policy. We're very concerned about our members' ability to pay as well as their employees' ability to pay. Um, and we're taxpayers at the end of the day. We're, you know, qualified to talk about the big picture, not necessarily the nitty gritty, but we can get into some of the nitty gritty with you. Uh, because some of you folks, I've never actually testified before this committee before. Um, I just kind of get a quick intro to the Lake Champlain Chamber. Uh, we're a regional chamber of commerce serving the northwestern portion of the state, seeking to uh, uh, create an economic opportunity for all, celebrating business ownership, promoting a robust, diversified visitor economy, cultivating community leadership, and nurturing emerging talent through the programs you can see on here. So it's like our regional marketing organization that is converting over uh, leads for room nights and conferences in our hotel spaces that helps fill shoulder seasons and keep our robust rooms and meals tax and sale, uh, revenue coming in. 
uh, Talent BTV, which is our young professionals work, and some of our ta other talent development programs, ranging from internships to many other things. Leadership development uh, for uh, aspiring C-suite staff, as well as C-suite staff, um, and our business accelerator. Um, business accelerator is a great way to land, actually, uh, one to end on, because that's actually a 14, uh, that's a, that covers every county, and um, it's emblematic how, despite the fact that we are a regional chamber of commerce, we have statewide programming. We try to include every county in of our over 1,000, 1,100 members or so. Uh, we have members in every single county of the state. Uh, because of these services, we uh, operate through Hello Burlington, the now defunct Vermont Convention Bureau, uh, and many other services like that. So. There are a lot of different doors that folks enter the chamber through, um, and you might have done that so yourself, not realizing you're entering the Lake Champlain Chamber. We have a big reach. Can I ask you a quick question about that? Yeah. Uh, what I always wanted to know this, but what when you say regional, is it is it mainly um, our county up in or you know? Yeah, so we describe it the northwestern uh, first like quadrant state. Uh, a lot of Franklin County too, okay. down to Aston County, we have Lamoille members. Um, what I actually split best describes our coverage is the greater Burlington metro area, uh, which with, overlaps perfectly actually, it's uh, this is really dirty, but the Bureau of Labor Statistics, Burlington, South Burlington metro area uh, is like exactly almost, when you do a heat map for our members, what we cover. Okay, so like um, the Champlain Islands as well? Yes, yes, so the well, Champlain Islands are a large part of our membership. Uh, we actually operate uh, a lot of the welcome centers around the state, including the ones in the islands. Um, so that's a, yet another thing we do. Um, but yeah, we, we cover all that. Really anything within a 40 minute drive to Burlington. Um, I'll just acknowledge, I don't want to go into, it's not the best use of my time, the Levers in Vermont's Education Fund, which was provided to you by the Joint Fiscal Office as required under statute, uh, and it's adjusting of staff issues, mandating mergers, consolidating administrative services, but, you know, all of those levers that you can pull to address this current funding crisis, um, you know, we encourage you to follow those uh, diligently. Uh, however, I'm not here to recap those or advocate for any of those particular. Um, what we are here to do is talk about uh, our perspective on, um, you know, just the economy at large uh, and um, our how it ties to education funding more acutely in housing growth and grant lists because um, we're really talking about the sustainability and stability of our tax base. We really need to remove perverse incentives uh, for individuals, communities, and that also have an economy-wide scale. Uh, we need to visit current policy that is working against itself, and we need to incentivize grantless growth, uh, as well as the items in the slide before, which are you know about right sizing and cuts. Our decisions, uh, you know, as I said, have been at odds with each other. Uh, growth and education spending is unsustainable. It needs to be more transparent, and thus better linked to local decisions and better linked to the economy. Uh, growth in tax reach has not, uh, should not be mistaken as growth in tax base. I'd say that most of our tax base growth we've talked about in this building over the last decade has really been about reach. Um, sorry, can you just clarify what tax reach means? Yeah, so I think a great example of, uh, you know, here folks stand up before and say, we're broadening our tax base by bringing in cloud-based computing, um, you know, and, and letting the sales tax on that. That's not true base growth necessarily. That might be adding another thing, another reaching to another thing to bring in. But what we'd rather see is on the Chamber of Commerce is uh, more individuals paying the tax by virtue of growing our economy, growing our population, growing our housing stock. And then them all actually contributing more in taxes by virtue of improved economic conditions. Thank you. Uh, so the final thing I'll leave on this slide is whether we like it or not, education funding decisions are housing policy decisions because we are primarily funding our education fund or, or a large part, uh, not not entirely, but we're in a large part of, uh, by using our property tax. Um, so the outcomes of some of the things we've done with property tax have stagnated our housing market and therefore added to the problem. I'll get to that in a little bit. 
But this didn't happen overnight. Uh, while there have been multiple attempts to drive down costs, raise revenue, and other things, um, you know, we're we caught it on a runaway train. And these are graphs actually provided to you by your joint fiscal office in that levers report as well as. Um, and uh, you know, we our primary our primary response has been adding sales tax, uh, adding you know, rooms and mails tax directing those entirely, ending the general fund transfer. We got saved to a large extent by South Dakota versus Wayfair, which brought in online sales. Uh, you know, frankly, we would have had a reckoning, but for the pandemic and all the federal largesse that came through, we would have had a, another reckoning following that disappearing, but for the fact that that largesse uh, in terms of stimulus had made its way through the economy and was showing up in our trust taxes in a robust way. But now the chickens have really come home to roost and, and we're in a difficult place where we need to stop the runaway train. Uh, this is kind of getting a little, and I'll skip over this just for the sake of time, getting a little bit more about what we talked about with tax base and tax reach. But we don't have uh, sustainable groundless growth in the state. I think there's a large component of what I want to talk to you about today. If there's anything you can walk out of this with is I want to just drive home for you folks that part of our education funding pro problem is our housing problem. And I'm sure that in this committee, you hear from the experts in education about their constituency struggles with housing too. I know I was talking to the NEA just the other day about how you know their teachers are having trouble finding housing, how the students are under house and that's, or, or not housed and that's having impacts on the schools. Housing is the lowest common denominator in the state. All problems, frankly, lead back to housing. Heck, even when I try to talk to my developers about what they need to build more housing, they tell me they need housing for their staff. And I say, you're the housing people. Why do you need housing? And that's just the, it's indicative of where we are today. Um, and I think actually our, our education funding uh, system and our property tax system in some way has led to that. Uh, here is a sharp graph of, uh, of uh, municipal grand list growth rates between 2011 and 2021. Excluding, and this is important, uh, appreciation in utilities. Um, and that should be an and, not a or. But that's important because we're not looking at the inflation and we're not looking at you know expenditures by utilities, which can distort that. What you can see here is you know, the majority of our municipalities are under two or three percent in grand less growth. And that's you know with an average of one, one and a quarter. Uh, you can see here some of the top 20. Brandless growers, which I think is going to be interesting when we look at the context of town meeting day conversation for the next. But also look at this in the context of housing. You can see housing growth has um, you know dropped exponentially over you know the last forty years, um, and we're not growing at a fast enough rate for just replacement of housing stock that is uh, continually depreciating. We have the second most housing stock in the country, and that actually gets to this graph here on the right. Uh, do, you, do you, if I could, yeah. you know, going back to the previous slide, are you off, are you a, in any position to offer the reasoning of why you think this housing stock is dropped, such as you put out here? There's a number, uh, there's a more towards it, so I love that you're ahead of me. Uh, there's a number of reasons. Is it, is it deeper in, second wave? Yeah, yeah, I think, right. well, I think part of it is, um, and I can start here, uh, is in a, you know, I think we had issues around, uh, you know, regulation. I think, I think we've all had conversations in this building about Act 250, around, uh, you know, some of our exclusionary zoning in the state. Uh, I also think that in a post Brigham world, development looks different. Um, and that's where it kind of gets into education funding too. Uh, and I'll get to that in a second. Uh, I want to just, Touch on, I said, you know, replacing destroyed homes. You can see here uh, 2,500 homes or almost 2,600 homes go offline in a given year uh, or at a usual, just a normal course of a, a decade because of how old our housing stock is. Uh, my point here to some extent is if we had, um, you know, just 11,000 homes that our housing needs assessment has said need uh, acutely. And they went for the median price statewide of four hundred thousand, with an anticipated tax bill of at least you know fifty two fifty three hundred dollars per year. We'd be looking about fifty eight million 
you know, that we could have right now in the education fund that would help you close some of that gap. Um, not to mention the economic multiplier effect that would have of stably housed people who can participate in our economy, both as employees, but also as consumers who go out and buy things that contribute to sales and use, rooms and meals, their personal income comes in, and our businesses could have a you know a more robust workforce and grow, and we can see that with corporate income tax. All things that fund what your priorities are. Um, and so, you know, I think our members are, you know, willing to pay for the price of education. They understand the importance of education. They can see that, you know, an individual they might be investing in today at the start of their educational journey is their employee in, you know, 10, 15 years. Uh, you know, but they also, they can't just be the full source of it. And you got to let them loose and let them do the things that they're best at so they can contribute. Um, so this is uh, kind of bouncing all over a little bit here as I'm trying to speed up, but uh, going back to that brandless growth conversation, um, you can see here, you know, some of those towns have great brandless growth. They're also in some of the places we have very large schools. Uh, and out of our town meeting day, we saw that our large schools, 52% uh, of them were rejecting budgets. Our next year at large, 38% were rejecting their budgets. Uh, our medium and small schools were less likely to. And the graph to the right of that uh, shows how education spending uh, per plus people is barely is below the state average and mean. Uh, they rank, you know, in some of our cheaper schools, yet they were voting down their budgets. And these folks are, uh, these districts in our, you know, our analysis are, are the ones who are, uh, are actually reducing brandless growth that's being sent into the state coffers to then get redistributed back out. They're also lower in cost, and they've done everything that's been asked of them over the last few decades as far as merging and finding efficiencies. Uh, and those are primarily the folks that I represent. So what I think is helpful is to kind of walk through a little bit just understanding how I help them understand education property tax and uh, show how it's hard to explain to them, to voters, how this works, and also talk about some of our changes we have uh, some perspective on. So understanding property tax is nearly impossible, and I think it's easy. It, an easy way to do this. Sorry, you want to jump in? Sorry, yes. so I, I want to, I'm anxious to hear what you have to say. Um, but do you do your members have a sense when I look back on the slide of per pupil spending? Do you guys ever have the conversation of like? What should the per pupil spending be? Like, what do you have a number in mind that would be you feel or your membership feels would be adequate to educate a kid in Vermont? Well, I'd say that I definitely hear from my membership who can do, you know, who can research on their own that they're seeing that we have the, you know, the second highest per pupil spending in the country. And this will, this year will probably put us into the highest per pupil spending. They, you know, they also can. Do a quick Google search and see that our educational outcomes are middle of the pack and dropping. So I think for them, you know, it's it's about they're willing to pay, mm -hmm. but they're going to pay the highest in the country. They want the highest outcomes in the country, and I think that's a frustration now. Um, I, I, I just I I always find the number these numbers interesting because about ten years ago when I looked at a thirteenth year for my daughter at Deerfield Academy, it was fifty four thousand dollars without, and I was with a scholarship. Um, that was ten years ago. Um, granted, that included room and board, but um, I, I just would it be it would be interesting to tease out a number that people think would be adequate to educate kids. I just I'm always like in my mind mm -hmm. thinking, what would that look like? Um, we know high school kids are more expensive to educate than elementary school kids, but when you think about you know sports and music, the drama, like everything they get in an education, I think. Love to, if you ever yeah. come up with a number, I, I think it's a great it. idea. I, I mean, it would, yeah. even if even if this at some point the legislature could get in mm -hmm. our minds, like okay, it's going to cost about this or about that, given everything that we want students to be able to take advantage of. Well, I think what our members are more interested in is frankly how can we uh, find efficiencies in the spending we already have, and I think that goes to the conversations that are having being had around the building around newer and fewer and around shared resources. And we had three pieces of uh, incredibly large piece of legislation around merging over the last decade. Um, and I'm going to get into that a, little, a second here. So 
I'm going to break down the district homestead property tax uh, formula into its constituencies to talk through it a little bit better. So one, education spending, two, equalized peoples, and three, statewide property. So education spending, um, you know, this is just our, obviously our issues around deciding the local level uh, with expectation of a statewide property tax kind of distorting those choices. And oh, this right. gets to our I grandless mean, growth conversation around pre Brigham because pre Brigham, if you were trying to talk about your local spending, what were you doing? You were likely, it was likely spurring some effort to grow the grant list to fund that spending. That would mean bringing in a new large employer who would be tax base or expanding housing stock or revitalizing your community or some combination of those things. But the attempt, the understanding would be with a local school district, pre Brigham, that you were on the hook for whatever you wanted to do, whatever your local education priority was. We're not saying go back to, you know, pre-97 world or pre-2003 world and, and you know, recreate the inequity of that. We understand that you know, some towns were gold towns, some towns were having a hard time educating their populace, but there needs to be a closer tie to decisions of voters and their, uh, you know, it, the spending. And there also needs to be a better understanding for voters, municipalities, school districts, everyone involved of what actually is funding this. This money just doesn't magically appear. It's created through economic development and, and housing development and other activities such as that. Um, you know, right now, ironically, a lot of groundless growth is not rewarded in our current system. And so you look back at, you know, some of the folks who are in the top 20 grant list growth, they're seeing that growth get sent to Montpelier, and then they're having to make hard austerity choices in their district level, you know, but for Brigham, they wouldn't have to make these hard choices. They could have the district that they wanted, and they could do all the things that they wanted. So I think that's, um, and then that manifests itself into some of our, our frankly, exclusionary zoning. If you're already have a high propensity to say no to things in your backyard, which let's face it, monsters do have that. What incentives are there now to say yes when you know that you know you don't want to see that and the grand list group from that isn't going to go to your community. It's going to get sent to Montpelier and then go to someone else's community. Uh, so when grand list growth is everyone's job, it kind of ends up being no one's job. And it's kind of akin to if you ever taken a CPR class, they tell you when you start doing CPR, look at a person, point them and say, you call 911. Because if you say someone call 911, then everyone assumes someone's calling them with one. No one takes it personally as their job. Uh, and that's kind of what we're in a position of with grantless growth. So second constituency of that equation is equalized peoples. And that gets to the point I was trying to make earlier about how Act 117 is kind of at odds with what we did in you know both Act 153, Act 156, and Act 46, which was trying to push rural and small schools to merge. Uh, when we added a, you know, a sparsity and a small school uh, weight and you let folks buy down property tax rates with that, you're working against every piece of legislation, you know, marquee piece of legislation you've had over the last decade and beyond. Um, you know, from our perspective, it might be more appropriate to put that into the categorical aid uh, category or for those weights or or do something of that nature, not just let those buy down. Now, I know that the idea then would we had this to be around ELL and economically deprived background weights, I would say that those are still appropriate to not be pushed in the categorical aid because I think ELL is a much larger conversation about how to support and stand up students who are new Americans. Uh, that does take you know the ability to to be much more uh, uh have much more dexterity. And then I think economically by backgrounds is a greater indication of how that community's ability to pay. Uh, frankly, if we could burn down the system today and redo it, and we were going to have the weights, I'd say like maybe economically by background might be a better way to get at um, some of our statewide equity than actually a, like a purely statewide program. But that's for another day. You know, time for that. Um, and then you know, this all fits together in the last part of uh, the, uh, the equation, the denominator, and that's the yield. Um, and I think that we had a really, because we had a lot of time in 
house education, we had a really robust conversation around uh, is statewide property yield uh, something that districts use to make their education spending decisions, or is the yield actually something that comes after? And I would say, uh, you know, it's a chicken and egg conversation. I would say that uh, statewide property yield is frankly, it's a legislative conversation that's done in reaction to what districts say. Uh, where, and I think just the timeline alone supports my argument because you don't set the, we're not going to set the yield this year until probably at least April 16th because the last votes are going to happen April 15th. Uh, so, and we've already voted on our budgets. We've already voted on our budgets. The yield set far after budgets get voted on. So, uh, you know, one thing that could be a discussion to try to keep the statewide pro system while also making voters feel the impact, communities feel the impact of their decisions a little bit more acutely, is discussing playing with that yield number and making it a smaller number which effectively makes dollars more expensive for humanities. When you shrink the denominator of an equation while keeping the numerator the same, or in this case, growing the numerator, you make the overall outcome more expensive. And really, at its most simple, the yield is the cost of buying a statewide dollar for a community. Um, you could also bring back excessive spending adjustments uh, that was suspended through 2029. That was something JFO suggested to you folks. Um, that's another way to go about it. There's a fourth item here that I kind of want to talk a little bit about um, that also further distorts our property tax system, and that's the homestead declaration and the property tax credit. Uh, because the income sensitized property taxes, uh, you know, if one of your constituents, one of my members can manage to get through that very complicated education um, spending formula, they still would need to understand the difference between property tax yield and income tax yield, the delta of which turns out to be a property tax credit. And this distorts um, the what happens even further because a voter might know, oh, my property tax goes up, but they might be income sensitized. So they might feel like they're protected or they might learn they're not protected after voting. Um, and that's two thirds of Vermonters pay based on their income already. Uh, it's, and I also think it's not truly reflective of one's ability to pay. And so to get at that, I've got this little example here. So this is actually a three bedroom home that I pulled on the Zillow. Uh, and there's three individuals in this scenario. All three are working uh, at working age and they have this, the same median salary. And that's the salary of actually the South Carolina high school teacher. Uh, however, there's, you know, this first differently. So, in the one household, we have two teachers. They're both making sixty-five thousand for a confined uh, household income of one hundred thirty thousand. The, um, they actually have you know two dependents, and in the other one, we have one teacher making the same exact salary, but they're living all by themselves in the same in that three-bedroom home. The couple with the dependents is exceeding the property tax credit income tax, which is now one hundred and twenty-eight uh, twenty-eight thousand. It's worth noting that that's been marched down over the last decade to make this program. Uh, actually work and not be too big of a revenue expenditure. I think it was probably, if I can remember off the top of my head, it was 150,000 uh, per household just six years ago and since has been brought down. Um, but they're past this cap. Well, this individual is getting a property tax credit of you know $3,675. I would encourage you to, you can actually go to the Vermont Department of Taxes website and download their property tax credit sandbox and play with this on your own. It's fascinating when you start to get into it. And we have some economic model we've done with that on the back end, which is uh, what I can play around with you folks sometime, if you have more time to do. But, uh, you know, we have this ethos of one's ability to pay, and we have, it's kind of based on marginal utility. But I'd ask, you know, who gets more marginal utility out of three bedrooms, a single individual or a family of four? Um, you know, I think that that's an interesting kind of dichotomy here. Why are we subsidizing someone who's overhoused? It goes actually another way when we start looking at this. Which, if I may, I think if some people overhoused, they might be renting a room, they might be you know, getting some income. It actually speaks really well to my point still because. Um, oh, no, no, and I, I yeah, know that. You know, but yeah. if, if you were to say, if you were overhoused and you said, I want to bring a, a roommate into this situation, uh -huh. your roommate's income counts towards your property tax credit because it's 
all of the income domicile in the house, regardless of relationships. We actually, uh, about two years ago, changed this to exclude qualified refugees uh, because qualified refugees were coming and people were being kind enough to bring them into their own homes, but then they were getting hurt because those refugees were able to work and however much they're bringing is pushing them out of property tax credit. Uh, so, you know, we've already kind of acknowledged the ludicrous nature of this to some extent in our tax code, but we need to go a little bit step further. It also, um, you know, it's more interesting when you look at it in terms of someone who is possibly retired and you look at the net assets. So same example, but let's say this person is drawing 65K from investments, not from a, a job and they're an empty nester and they're sitting on 4 million in net assets with no mortgage. Meanwhile, this couple that we talked about in the first example has 50K in student debts and there's only three years in a mortgage. So they haven't even started paying off principal. They're only in the interest zone. Um, you know, because they used a three and a half percent BHFA loan, let's say, which thank you all for supporting that. But, you know, in this situation, we're kind of subsidizing someone from being overhoused, and it's not indicative of their ability to pay. It's indicative of what they set their income at when they talk to their retirement professional. Uh, they have the ability to pay. And that also drives housing decisions because, uh, you know, what, what in this example, what incentive is there for this person? Let's say that they're they're down to paying only about twelve hundred dollars a year uh, to live in that home. They're going to stay in that home longer. They're actually kind of trapped on the tax cut of this because they don't have that economic nudge. So they're going to live in this home. They're likely going to defer maintenance, which means that when that house goes back on the housing market, it's not going to just be a uh, you know a four hundred thousand dollar house. It'll be a four hundred thousand dollar house with a hundred thousand dollars of deferred maintenance attached to it which is why we have the hit program again thank you for your support of that but um you know we're distorting the housing market with this to a large extent is my point um you know whether you like it or not our education property tax conversations are housing conversations because we've stagnated the housing market and it only is going to get worse as our demographics age and you can see by this in the right hand corner, this is from our housing needs assessment. We're already a very overhoused population. So if you want some more tax revenue, you got to get this housing market churning. And that means maybe some changes to the property tax credit. Sorry. No, it's okay. Um, thanks, Austin. I just wanted to highlight or underscore this scenario that you have here with the, <laughs> the one person in the home with, uh, I know so many couples in that exact situation who want to pay more. like they they want to pay more and they they're embarrassed about their tax credit like they don't want it well they can always deny that is okay. an option okay all uh, right I, that's good to know wait repeat that option you can always not well actually so vermonters a lot of times don't file oh, uh, yeah. for homestead declaration yeah. because it is so unique to the state use a lot of a uh, lot of tax software they frankly get it wrong mm -hmm. uh, i've even experienced that myself uh, so Homestead declaration is very difficult. So some people could not actually worry this year that that revenue expenditure, that like two thirds of Vermonters might grow mm -hmm. because I think you're going to induce some demand when people see these high property tax bills, people who might have skipped the homestead declaration step or, or like the property tax credit step or, or just, you know, missed it entirely. They're going to be searching for right. that property tax credit. Right. So that could even grow this year. And if anything, you need to shrink it. Um, that's, so that's good to know. I do think there are folks who understand the scenario and, and understand the inequity in it. Yeah. They've heard it over and over and over again. And like I said, I think it's only going to get worse as our demographics shift older. And so, um, you know, I don't, I'm not saying we should be cruel and try to like push property taxes up and push, you know, older Vermont out of homes. I think there's some ways we could do this. I think we've actually, by being kind, been a little cruel. We've trapped some Vermonters by like, subsidizing their property tax rates, which would otherwise in any other situation, in any other state, been an economic nudge to right-size their housing stock. I know a lot of folks will say to me, well, you know, Austin, did, a lot of folks would want to leave their housing stock, but there's nothing for them to go to. It's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. You know, if we aren't incentivizing that, then the market's not seeing the demand for that. And if the market's not seeing the demand for that, it's not creating that. And, it's a feedback loop. So, um, 
we need to break that cycle. One thing we're interested in pursuing, and it's too late in session like for this, but as a seller's credit, uh, much like the, the Biden administration proposed in the State of the Union last month, that would uh, actually provide an ability for uh, an individual to realize some of their PTC in their next domicile. Um, and they could, you know, sell and maybe they move to something, they take that activate from what they sold, they move to something that's maybe not as efficient of a planning solution, but they can see that PTC stepped out over a, a five-year basis on the taxes of their new uh, domicile, which would hopefully be smaller. So, um, yeah, so suggestions, and we kind of got into this, uh, consider homestead declarations and rent or rebate, um, you know, should they include attestations of household kind of well, um, you know, I think we frankly do that this year as just a box on homestead declaration, not this year, but the coming fiscal year. Uh, and it could frankly be a toothless tiger this year. Um, but most people with high net wealth are getting their taxes done by professionals. Those professionals will check that box, you know, saying, okay, we do have net wealth above this, so we're not going to... Uh, we're not going to use this or we'll just not follow the PTC process. Um, you know, I think Later on down the road, you can figure out how to enforce it better. But for now, it could honestly just start that way because of the professionals who do that. Um, I think it also, you know, we have statuses like dependents and married by them jointly in our tax code for a reason. I think that the PTC should, you know, continue to exist and it can continue to exist, should reflect the makeup of the household and the earners in that and not penalize people who are living more densely or putting a bunch of earners under one roof. I mean, as it stands right now, I've talked to, to folks who have told me about how they had a child come back to live with them, you know, who's in their 20s and is trying to get a foothold back in Vermont. And that child's income has pushed them out of property, you know, tax credit range because the child's making enough money that it's in its household income. It's not individual per household, it's household. Uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, we think we need to get our housing market churning a little bit more and bring down this overhouse status that we have. We're one of the most overhouse states in the country. Uh, ironically, you know, one thing to not do is one thing to do is, is project an increase in the property transfer tax. Uh, if you're trying to get people to exit housing, do not put a tax on exiting housing. You know, that is uh, even if it one might say, oh, that's that's paid by the buyer, not the seller. Like we've all sat down, most of us have probably sat down and negotiated a you know a closing of a, a home at one point like it all ends up being one chunk of money and it affects it so um and then i think it's also worth talking about how like we might need a cla equivalent uh for homestead taxes that uh you know as areas of growth with higher property values hit caps more easily than others this is a conversation that's um kind of tearing apart folks upstairs right now because they just increased property transfer tax in h829 and he wanted to just start the highest threshold at 600,000. And a lot of legislators from Chittenden County have said, well, wait a minute, that's a lot of homes in Chittenden County. And those homes aren't extravagant homes. It's just, you know, live in Main Street, Burlington. That's what it, it costs, you know? So, uh, you know, the statewide <coughs> caps on both the, the home site value and the cap on the uh, income, those are you know, disproportionately affecting, you know, different parts of the state. Uh, it takes one hundred and twenty-eight thousand dollars in Chittenden County looks a lot different than one hundred and twenty-eight thousand dollars in other parts of the state uh, because of the high cost of living that it requires to live in Chittenden County. And we we reflect that to get back to my point earlier about the Bureau of Labor Statistics. My area, there are discrepancies in wages in those places, but there's also discrepancies in the cost of housing, the cost of the essential goods. That's why our basic needs budgets the state has a an urban and a rural component to it, and that's that's a long standing bit. Um, so I want to actually uh, kind of drop is I'm going to go to like the quick overview. So the things to really take away from this conversation that I had, and I'm sorry, rush this as much as possible. Some of it might have been lost. We're happy to talk with anyone, but Vermont education, Vermont's education system is growing unsustainably. It's been mitigating by adding new revenue streams and a few miracle events, frankly. Uh, local decisions funded through statewide mechanisms create disconnects between choices and tax rates, uh, resembling a tragedy of the common scenario. Uh, the complexity of Vermont's education funding system 
vendors, public understanding, and engagement. Whether we like it or not, education property tax policy is housing policy. Education uh, property policies significantly influence the housing and development market, <clears throat> have stalled the housing uh, stock growth, and discouraged tax-based improvements. Attempts at equity or mitigating expensive property taxes have diluted our community's uh, community decision-making and contributing to stagnating grant list growth. Property tax credit system impacting two-thirds of Vermonters for those sorts of community decisions. These efforts uh, have also created perverse incentives and unfairly shifted burdens in Vermont onto larger households, including those with multiple earners. Real grant list growth remains minimal, especially in municipalities focused uh, on uh, well, actually, this should be backwards, bad bullet, I'll have to edit this. Uh, but, you know, those folks who actually are finding the efficiencies for making union school districts who are building grant lists, they're the ones voting down their budgets. And they're kind of being asked to bring more to the statewide system, and they've really done all they can. Uh, we need to have collaboration across housing and economic development sectors uh, to support our education system financially. And then I think you should also explore the fiscal levers that were outlined to you by JFO and moving forward. Yeah. Thank you so much, Austin. This is great. Um, and I appreciate the bullet points and the and the real the you know clear breakdown. I just uh I like to focus when I can anyway on data and facts rather than anecdotes and hyperbole and all those good things. So for example, like just this the first bullet. Um and uh, by the way, I totally agree with you about efficiencies and right sizing and it's completely in agreement with you. But I do struggle a little bit, you know, Vermont's education system is growing unsustainably, which has been mitigated by the addition of new revenue streams and a few miracles. I just um sort of playing devil's advocate here, but what does unsustainably mean? Um, is is it unsustainable uh, by virtue of the fact that people are voting down school budgets? I mean, is that is that what makes it unsustainable? Because I do look at some of the communities around where I live that have voted down their school budgets, and I'm thinking the majority of the people in that, I mean, the average income in that town is like the highest in the state or second highest. Mm -hmm. So I just I just question. Well, I think that anyone can agree it's unsustainable, whether that you think it's unsustainable to keep having these school budgets get voted down, or you think that we can't handle a you know twenty percent chunk of property taxes this year. Um, I think one great example though, like you know, I think kind of what you're talking about bringing to the lines is, is CBU. And that's a pretty there's some pretty wealthy towns in there. Granted, like a lot of those towns that feed CBU are uh those are where groundless growth has happened. So incomes are higher, sure, but they're pulling their weight and then some in the statewide system. Uh, I like to think about also Winooski. So like I, I live in Winooski, and I think it's really ironic. When you look at Winooski, its downtown improvement district was grown from being worth 24 million to 104 million over the last two decades. It's one of, it, Winooski as a whole is one of the only growing municipalities in the state, despite the fact that it's it's got a geographical borders that are the highway and the river, um, and it really can't grow much, but it's been welcoming to new American populations. It's been welcoming to new businesses. It's developed housing, uh, you know, far and above its its weight class. Yeah, you know, it's punching well above its weight class. Um, one twenty seven. You know, there's a lot of folks saying, "Oh, like all this money's getting sent to Winooski through one twenty seven. It's waiting. They're making out like bandits." If we were to undo this, like, really just layered on, I like to think of our education funding system as like an old farmhouse that we've all probably done renovations on one of those at some point because we're all monitors. Like, it's not intentional. You know, you find like layers of shift lap and then drywall and then, you know, all these things. It's just, it's been kind of glommed together as we go. It's this big Rube Goldberg machine. And if you were to not have that, you were just to have Winooski's budget alongside Winooski's grand list growth, Winooski's covering what it, it doesn't need all this rigmarole of Montpelier potentially to, to get at the funding that it wants. It's it's growing. And so I think that's just, and it's a really long way of saying, like, I think at the end of the day, the folks, like, you're going to see CBU, you've seen CBU vote down their budget. Uh, 
you know, you all saw Colchester to the north of you vote down their budget. Um, these are places that are actually doing their part and trying to like grow the, the and being welcoming to other populations, to development, to new employers, to to actually fund this stuff. So I think that's a that's where it comes down to is um, you know if you want a forty person headcount with thirteen staff, uh, you know find an employer to fund that, <laughs> like so, build some more right. housing around it so that you also can bring in more children into that right. school system, you know? Is there time okay? We're okay, yeah. yeah. So, I, so I would just want, so I know this is a policy decision and I'm gonna have that bumper sticker made for this committee because they need it. <laughs> but my colleague, uh, Senator Weeks, is often asking, well, what's the strategy? What's the plan? So I know you can't dictate policy to us, but what, we have a pretty rural state, so you're right. We do have like these small schools, these rural areas. The two of us sat in the school construction task force, so we were grappling with these issues. But what is the answer? Uh, do you like build a regional school? Do you more busing? More like, do you have any well, I think, thoughts? You know, I think that the outcome of that committee, fewer and fewer, is important. I think we need to start thinking at a county level. I love S159. Uh, that Senator Hardy had like, pushed through uh, around, and I wish it could have been done two years ago because I think it'd be really. A, a, oh, this a, is the municipal study. Municipal, yeah. well, it was uh, regional and county governance. Um, right. And I think that that could be a great, if we had the outcome of that study, it could be a, something that could serve as a, you know, a North Star for the newer and fewer conversation. Because I think that the future of the state needs to be more regionally or, or countywide shared infrastructure for schools. I mean, not every school needs the new athletic facility. Maybe we can centrally locate some. Uh, you know, I think we need to pull smaller schools into bigger schools. Uh, if, you know, if the worry is transportation, like let's mitigate those worries, but let's not let them get in the way. I personally grew up in a, what would be considered a union school of 18 towns. And my biggest pet peeve of it uh, was that I didn't have a big enough school even after all that, like I would have loved to go to a big school. So I think we need to, to do that. I think we need to look at a county-wide level or regional as it makes sense to find the shared infrastructure. Uh, um, two questions, this is this will be it for me, but did you follow the BOCES bill and what's your opinion on that? And did you live in the BOCES world? Because you grew up in New York and I know New York has BOCES. So can you speak to that one? You may not have followed it. I did. I followed the BOCES to some extent. I grew up in upstate New York um, where there was BOCES. I don't think I can talk eloquently enough on it, but uh, I think it's it's getting at what I'm saying, you know, shared responsibility, shared resources, shared outcomes, and, and uh, shared funding. And uh, I think the, end, the crux of it is a lot of our issues in Vermont are, you know, unforced errors that are on the basis of like trying to think too tribally between all of our small municipalities. Uh, we need to start thinking more regionally about everything. Um, when I was in the education, the House Education Committee, we talked, I talked a little bit about just uh, picking on uh, Casey Tubes district, you know, they built a, a pool shared between multiple communities. And it was like groundbreaking to hear people talk about it. Like, oh yeah, no, there's- A this, swimming pool? Yeah, it, it, hard act. I don't know if familiar folks are oh, yeah, yeah. but, but they built a swimming pool there. And, you know, it was, it was funded between multiple communities and they have this like whole, I'm like, this shouldn't be groundbreaking. Anywhere else in the world, you know, six towns sharing a pool is very normal. But like in Vermont, that took like a, a whiz kit of a city manager and a lot of work to pull off. And it, you know, it, that shouldn't be how it is. And I think we need to get to that um, to make our, our education system right-sized. Um, you know, I'm not yeah, saying yeah. necessarily like, let's lower the poor people spending, but let's spend it more efficiently and you know, let's get back to these Municipalities and school districts can also partner with each other. There are a lot of places in the country where there's a pool in a high school that serves the retired community as well as the students. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a thing. Open on the weekend. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But exactly. I think we can all agree we tried to do something between municipalities. I mean, I sit on the board of Green Mountain Transit in my volunteer role, and that is, uh, that just is exemplary right? of how difficult it is to get, you know, more than 10 municipalities to agree on anything 
and find something and try to understand that they're, you know, they need to come together for the collective good. And then if you try to increase that after you've been able to do that, forget about it. So, uh, you know, we need more county or regional level, you know, leadership. Um, I think that there are some things, like I said, that can be done immediately around property tax credit to make that a little bit more equitable um, and reflective of, you know, the fact that that revenue expenditure will grow as our aging population grows and they start to be on fixed incomes, which aren't always just fixed incomes. They're just what is coming out as a trickle from a large pile of assets. So I think that's a conversation. Uh, we need more housing. And right now, you know, your colleagues in Senate Natural are discussing housing bill. Uh, you know, if we had, I've been working on some iteration of this Act 250 modernization conversation for six years now. Um, you know, some of the work that is Tier 1A and Tier 1B that is in that has frankly been exactly what we've been asking for at the Lake Champlain Chamber for six years. We haven't had anyone tell us that they don't believe it's right. What we've had is this wait for a grand bargain situation so that we can have, you know, trade that for real rule and force fragmentation. And you know, nobody is set along the way, like, oh no, we should actually remove, like, we shouldn't remove mm -hmm. downtown Burlington for active 50 jurisdiction. Uh, if we had done it six years ago, maybe we'd be closer to that target of 11,000 housing units. And maybe we could have some of that 58 million I've discussed, you know, maybe we wouldn't have such a big deficit. Uh, so, you know, housing is education financing too. Mm -hmm. um, and it also means that when you go to do your collective bargaining agreements with teachers, they're not worried so much about their housing costs and they can actually live closer to the school if they work out and all these other things. So, um, you know, it's it's a very hairy, wicked, like, wicked problem we have here. Um, we didn't get into it overnight. We're not gonna get out of it overnight, but we can start understanding that our stagnation and groundless and housing has lent itself to this problem, and that could be a large component of getting out. Thank you, Austin. I appreciate you coming in. I mean, let's take five minutes. Uh, welcome back, everyone, to Senate Education, Tuesday, March 26, 321. We have an amendment uh, being proposed uh, by Senator Renner to S220. Senator Renner, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Senator Campion and committee members. Uh, I'm going to wear my lesson really quickly about this, but I did propose it on the floor to change a word in the library bill, S220, um, and you have it before you. It's in section 622 BSA, section 143, which is the trustees section. Um, it would say, if corrected, the board shall consist of not fewer than five members. So we're changing one word, less to fewer, with your blessing. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so we'll I'm need Beth to give us a walk. Hopefully. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so we can't do it like, tomorrow. Right. This Just is kidding. super controversial. Uh, <laughs> this, this <laughs> right. I enjoy the, the attention to grammar. Yes. I'd like to hear from the bees. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we have uh, draft 1.1 1 .1 of amendment to S220 before us. Committee, uh, do I have a motion? I'll make a motion to pass to amend S220 with Senator Render's amendment. And seconded. Second. Okay. Committee, any discussion? My only question you're yeah. an English teacher, right? No. Oh. When, when does use become the rule? You don't have to answer it. I'm just throwing it out there to the universe. Oh, okay. As it relates to grammar and, and language. Yeah. Yeah. But the, it's that's just a hypothetical. I'm in favor of this amendment. Uh, do you mind calling the roll as the vice chair? Oh, no, in absence of uh, Senator right. Williams. Um, great. So we got the that and we got the date. And um, let's see. Let's start with um, Senator Weeks. Uh, yes. Senator Machine? Yes. Um, I think, did Senator Williams, did he vote before he left? No. 
Senator Kulik is a yes, and Chair Campion. Yes. Wonderful. So we voted out four zero one. What's the you represent Milton, right? I do. Can you call the papers? It's the Milton newspaper up there. Yeah. Who would like to report the amendment? I believe Senator Renner will get up on the floor. Okay. And I believe Senator Renner, you need to bring a copy to the uh Secretary of okay. the And they're wait they know that it's coming. Oh, so. They do. Yeah. So they will, are either waiting for you or um, it may be waiting for other committees. I'm not sure. But if you don't mind bringing it up now like and let them know that the vote is 401 and you have a clean copy. Thank I don't think so we much. give them that. I don't think. Uh, Morgan, we don't send up this, right? We just send up the. Uh, yeah, we don't send up the ROA. So all you need to do is go up and say 401. And uh, okay. and there they are looking for you. Yes. Oh my goodness, you right. saved me a trip. No, nope. I was here for you. Anything else we can do for you? Can you tell me when do I stand up or do I not stand up? Uh, Morgan, we can go off as much as.